Paul, how are you, brother? All right. Good. How's yourself? Yes. <laughs> Wonderful, <laughs> mate. I mean, we're here to talk about um, certainly a, a, one of the subjects I'm fascinated in and um, I'm a little bit involved myself and certainly not to the extent that you are, but it's everything blades, isn't it? Everything uh, uh, sword making, knife making, yeah. armaments in general. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting world. Everyone, everyone likes shiny things, you know? Yes. <laughs> I'll just tell you my story very briefly, but I went to a bushcraft weekend about 15 years ago with a mate and we camped the weekend and went mm. to all kind of um, um, lectures while we were there. And one of the chat was a, a, a forger, <laughs> but a forger mm. in, in the sense of being a blacksmith. Yeah. And, and he not only met, you know, knocked up his own blades, but obviously did all the handles and everything. And he had a load of, um, parts you could buy so i bought some deer antler and some some of these kind of pre i don't know what you you call them but like prefabricated discs that you can use for making handles and stuff yeah and i knew i wanted to make a knife and it 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 took me 15 years to uh to actually make it but there it is (laughs) good job mate good job yeah that's um it's actually got my name and my bear claw logo etched on the blade, but it's come off when I sanded it. So you can, yeah. friends at home, you can just about make out the logo yeah, I can, there. I can see that, yeah. Nice one. Yeah. And I managed to find something that looks slightly bear clawish on uh, eBay. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I'm a great believer in, you know, follow your dreams, make them come true. Even if it did take me 15 years, it's, I will say, <laughs> That doesn't look much, but that's about three and probably three and a half thousand pounds worth of equipment all in just just to make make that knife. Countless, countless hours of work. Um, someone said to me, bloody hell, Chris, that's good. And I said, well, it's not it's not my skill. It's it's just that if you don't get it to a certain level of good, you have to throw it away. Mm, sure. <laughs> And do it again so it's it, it it doesn't take for anyone out there it, um you know to get to get started in this you don't you don't have to be you know i don't know some medieval japanese sword maker or <laughs> something but uh so that's my story um over to you mate how 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 did you get involved um, really, uh, just uh, as you said at the start, it was, it was following my own dreams and passions, really. Um, I came to Edinburgh in 92 uh, for university originally, realised quite shortly in that I wasn't going to do that course for the rest of my life, and I'd found something much more engaging along the way, and that was fencing originally. Uh, sport fencing, that's all there was at that time, but I just had, had, had a real natural fascination a kind of magnetism if you like towards the blades and towards the steel um at that time i found a couple of knife and uh dirk and ski and do the traditional scottish knife makers on edinburgh uh, edinburgh's royal mile um they took us in teaching us you know various skills and one of them offered me full-time work uh finishing uni uh, a couple of years later so um yeah uh, that that got me on that path and uh, I've followed it ever since, um, starting up my own armories in 98 and uh, very much working with the parallel path of the martial side of it as well in studying traditional swordsmanship and European martial arts and teaching that along the way as well. Incredible. I was fortunate to go to a couple of museums in Tokyo. One of them was the history of sword making. And it was sort of set out at, let's just say, 12 stanchions. Yeah. The first one showed the raw ore coming out the rock. The second showed where the swordsman, uh, the craftsman would like melt it down. Mm. The third showed where he'd weld it onto the end of a rod. Yeah. All all the uh, friends who've seen YouTube videos out there will know, (laughs) will will know that the process hasn't really changed, but the technology... Mm. The technology has um yeah. and then finally folding this blade you know just hammering it flat then folding it over and hammering it which are 
allegedly, if you believe the film Highlander, <laughs> they can do a thousand times. I'm not sure if that's uh, <laughs> that's the truth. But that's, uh, that's uh, and then to, to go to the, I think it was the National Museum and see the actual katanas there. Yeah. Uh, in all their glory. So the the original samurai swords all preserved um lots of handles lots of um what's the protective bit called the the super what i yep. call a hand guard but yeah um and i just love it mate you know i love the whole ancestry I, I, in fact the, mm -hmm. i'm gonna tell you one more anecdote bear with me folks yeah. uh, we're we are going to let Paul speak, but um, I was at a party once with a uni mate. Well, I think we just graduated and we were all a bit worse for wear at this party. And he went, Chris, look at this. He reached under the sofa and he pulled out a Japanese sword. And it was his great grandfather's uh, had been handed it by a prisoner of war in Burma. Um, and I didn't realize a lot of these Japanese officers were of samurai lineage. So mm. this sword would have been handed down, you know, over centuries. Mm -hmm. And what they would do when they joined the army is they would just change the handle part to have it sort of, um, you know, military standard, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And all it had on it was the scabbard was, was snapped in half. I remember thinking at the time, God, should I offer him like, you know, a grand for it or something. Cause I just, it just been my dream, dream to own one. And I didn't, and I met up with him recently and I said, you haven't still got that sword mate by any chance have you? He went, nah, mate, sold that 50 quid. No, <laughs> oh, no, good Lord. <laughs> oh. Wow. So, Sorry, we get, we diversify, we diverge, divulge, diverge, diverge. <laughs> we go off track, but yes, incredible. So, how did your career develop? What sort of stuff did you start um, producing? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> before before I started my own armories, um, I was really just making mild steel wall hangers for tourist market. You know, things that kind of looked like a sword from the other end of your room. Um, but weren't very functional. And I think I had a real, I had, uh, yeah, I just had a natural fascination for uh, the martial side and accuracy in reviving uh, the, the martial arts. And to do that, the only right way you can do that is to have the right weight, the right balance tool in your hand. So, you know, the swords have to be right. So I was always interested in making something more historically accurate. Um, and the only way I could realize that uh, I realized in the end was to start my own armory, start my own business mm -hmm. and, you know, learn as I, as I went, um, which I think with any craft, you're always learning and every day is a school day, you know, uh, you, ne you never stop learning that way. But uh, yeah, I had to, I had to take that, uh, that plunge and uh, started the armories in 98, uh, specializing in historically accurate swords and knives. That was the focus to start with. I didn't have a, a main product at that time. Um, but that certainly changed along the way as my interest grew and became a bit more focused as well. And um, it wasn't until 2008, um, myself and uh, a good friend uh, who was involved with the, the Academy of Arms at that time decided to start a World War II based living history group focusing on the original commando training um, from the Highland uh, training centres and the close combat was a focus of that and it was quite evident that the, the FS fighting knife, the, uh, the famous commando knife, was right at the heart of that too. Um, so that led to a path of, of a quite intense focus on that knife um, to remake it again and as accurately and as closely as the original World War II uh, examples and that has now become very much a main product. Is it fair to say, um, because I've handled one of these Sykes Fairburn, uh, do we, can we call them replicas? Is that what they're? Fairburn Sykes, yeah. Yeah, yeah recreations. Yeah. Yep. Um, 
I got given one for a, a Royal Marines event that I organized and the lads very kindly chipped in and they gave me the one that's in the frame and yeah took me about three years before I looked at it one day and thought is that plastic <laughs> 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 right and I'll start to but anyway I, I digress but um th- what I'm trying to say in it it's the black dagger it, it looks like it's formed from one one piece of metal yeah it'll probably be something like this that's right yeah yeah that's that's what we call the third pattern fs knife and that was the that was the last pattern that was developed in world war ii and it's the only pattern really that's been produced in number since since mm. that time since uh, 1943 bringing that forward a bit we i, I think i mentioned this to you when we spoke uh, i did a charity speed march last year up at acne carry oh yeah the one yeah we took uh, it was about 10 10 of us uh elite veterans or elite forces veterans um and we recreated the original speed march so the original nine miler carrying all the gear in the 90 minutes and the lads did really really well and we raised a lot of money for the royal marines charity but um someone and i am going to do a bit of googling mate to try to remember who which company it was but they very kindly donated a sykes fairburn replica and i it raised thousand over over a thousand pounds at least Mm -hmm. and what i was getting the point i was coming back to paul is to look at it i'd say that they'd made it way better than it probably was back in the day <laughs> yeah yeah um when you look at the closely at the, at the wartime originals you do see you know inconsistent grinds the center lines of the blades being slightly off or squiggly and uh, grind marks down the blades you know um, because it, w- it was wartime you know and they were mass producing as efficient hand crafting but still mass producing as efficiently as they could um, to keep up with the demand back then. So, yeah, I, I, I've, I've realised that along the way myself and I, I've come to terms with, you know, I don't have a problem in saying that, yeah, the blades that I make are of a higher quality than, you know, the, the blades uh, the blades then. But it's all, it's all towards still paying tribute, really, to the original makers and to, you know, the original personnel that carried them too. Yes, it's the ultimate tribute, isn't it? It's when you take something and you make it better. Is yeah. um, and back in the day, then were were they just sort of um, uh, so friends at home? The original commandos, Second World War, when they went behind, behind enemy lines, they were issued this dagger, and in essence, it was for stabbing the hell out of your enemy or taking out their windpipe or, or other such horrible. Uh, horrible ends um but it looked very basic paul as you just shown is is that any sort of form of carbon steel or can that just be any uh, yeah thing? i mean carbon steel uh hasn't really been improved on since the iron age you know for good uh sword or, or knife blades um the form of the knife everything about it it was all designed very specifically as a fighting knife not not a knife fighting knife, but as a knife designed for silent killing, for basically entering the body and exiting, causing as much trauma on the way out as possible and doing that job efficiently. You know, it wasn't a can opener. It wasn't a bushcraft or a fieldcraft knife. Um, Every knife in its own way is a a specific tool for a specific job. Mm -hmm. And that means that every knife in its own way is a compromise as well because it's not good for certain other jobs, you know. So th- that's that's exactly what the FS knife was designed for. Um, and uh, the FS, of course, Fairbairn Sykes, is named after William Fairbairn and Eric Sykes, who were the two close combat instructors, the original instructors that first established the close combat syllabus, talked to the commandos and subsequent SF. Yes, if they really knew commanders well, they'd have put a lanyard on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There must be loads of those left in, uh, you know, <laughs> occupied occupied France or something. Yeah. 
Oh, they're, they're absolutely. Weird. In fact, I have one um, that's uh, down in the armory downstairs. It's framed up and it was excavated in Sword Beach in 1968. A second pattern and the blade and the guard are, you know, extremely corroded. But the, br- the brass grip is very much intact. Mm. And so that is proudly framed up along with a, an image of um, four commando going forward in the beach that day. Do you have any more there, Paul, to show us? Yeah, I certainly do. Um, I've got a, a brief history of the FS knife. Please, right, please. I think right beside friends us at home would love to hear it. Yeah, no problem. Well, the story of the FS knife starts where Fairbairn and Sykes um, first were before, uh, before the Second World War, and that was Shanghai. They were officers in the, the Shanghai Municipal Police, and this was exactly the type of knife they developed for the police at that time. Uh, so this is now known as what you call a first pattern Shanghai knife. And you can see similarities to the FS knife. It's got uh, what you call the Coke bottle shaped grip. It's a bit shorter overall though, but it's got this tapering diamond section, double edged blade um, and straight guards. So, you know, the similarities are there. Um, but obviously the police are not using this for silent killing. That's kind of frowned upon, but uh, it was, basically a self-defense knife for the officers you know it was getting yourself out of a clinch if you got one or two lads on you already and pinning an arm or two against your body and they accessed it by carrying it in a scabbard like this upside down rigged to their shoulder uh, harness inside the jacket so all you need to do is put a hand inside your jacket and access your knife and cut your way out a clinch to overcome a situation and that was that was the very first origins of it. They then moved to brass grips for a bit more efficient production. Again, the brass grip formed the basis of the the FS knife production that came to that. How do, how do you get the gnarling on that handle? Uh, yeah, brass brass grips are turned and knurled. Uh, this is a second pattern FS knife. This is one of my own, and um, yeah, this is this is done by machine. The original grips were cast, and they were cast so that they could have a, a rectangular recess for the, the tang of the blade to continue up in. And, uh, and then they were turned to smoothen the surface, and then they were knurled by machine. And you have to follow the contours of the machine by, by hand as well. But, uh, this is um, a little bit different to the third pattern you might be used to, but this is the iconic first pattern FS knife right here. So these these were only produced in a very small number. This is an original piece um, made by Wilkinson Sword Company. And these were made from um, from about uh, January 41 to August 41 only, and only by Wilkinson Sword. And after that time, they moved to the second pattern uh, until October 43, when all production move to the, the third pattern. So by brief comparison, there's your first pattern. Uh, the first pattern has the uh, very slight S-shaped cross guard to it, as well as this blunted area here, the Rocasso. And the second pattern in comparison, hopefully you can see the slight difference, is a straight guard, doesn't have a little curve on it, more or less the same type of grip. Uh, knurled and turned but the edges of the blade went all the way to the guard this time and the third pattern similar to the second um, same blade and guard really but the only difference being the grips went to um, being cast in zinc alloy uh, and you can cast this concentric circle form if you tried that with knurling you would then have to you, you would interrupt the knurling it wouldn't work out so much. Fairbairn actually wasn't a big fan of the the cast grip in the end. He said it could actually turn in the hand if it's wet, you know, with water or blood or such, um, as opposed to the knurling, which tended to bite into the fingers a bit more. So it's, you know, it's got its own story and its own history. And I do like to pay tribute to that by using heritage materials and heritage wood especially so this is um uh, Achnacari wood uh, this is uh, spalted beech and from one of the trees 
that formed part of the original rope work course at the CBTC, the Commando Basic Training Centre, which is where all the recruits went through for their training at Aknakari between February 42 and the end of the war. Wow. And are you aware of the the top price one of these has, has fetched at, say, or auction or, or, or similar? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I donated one of the, the heritage knives uh, to, I think it was the Royal Marine uh, charity recently, and I think it fetched two grand at auction for them, so it did well at that. Mm. Stupid question time. Um, what's the fascination with these now? Why, why, why are they so beloved? Um, yeah, they're, they're still revered in a way amongst the forces communities because uh, I think, you know, it, it really symbolises the nature of the job, hmm. you know, about going forward by stealth when you get there, causing as much damage, devastation as you can and extracting with, you know, fewer or min minimum casualties. It's about that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, the, the essence of, who dares wins, if you like, you know, going forward with bravery to close with the enemy. And that takes, it takes balls, doesn't it? Mm. <laughs> and that knife has always, I think, symbolised that job. Took balls because, you know, a lot of these young lads didn't come back, did they? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. We, we, myself my, uh, and my mate Mike, I'd, I'd mentioned we'd started the Second World War group in 2008 and we were very lucky at that time when we did start it that there were there were still enough World War II veterans travelling to Fort William and Spee and Bridge every year for, for Remembrance Weekend events that we could you know sit down with them and engage with them and and they were invariably happy to share the stories of their training and their experience in, in theatre as well um, and it, it just incredible these lads, you know, the, the stories that came out with. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of folk will look at the knives today and not realise there'll be a disconnect between this nice, pretty, shiny thing and the job it was designed for. Because the job it's designed for is not a pretty one, you know, it's a messy one, quite literally. Um, and, yeah, you know, these lads were, were using these knives, you know, and they're still... Uh, they're still used today, in fact. You know, I think any form of theatre will always end up in some way in close combat. And when it comes to close combat, then we only the, the ancient ways and the ancient tools still work. You know, that's never going to change. So there's always room for and a place for a good knife in any theatre that way. Mm. Do you think the lads got to keep their knives or do you think they had to hand them back in when they finished their service? Yeah, a, a, a lot of them kept the knives. Uh, a lot of them kept the knives. And a lot, of, a lot of families, I've been contacted by a lot of families that have their, you know, fathers or grandfathers knives. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. If they were in, they, they kept them. Mm. Are you familiar with a chap, um, just get his name up, uh, Kyle Royer? Have, I'm not sure. No. Oh, wow. I, I just mention it because um, no. once you start knife making, suddenly your YouTube sh starts throwing up loads of life knife making yeah. videos. And sure. this, this chap's in America, and I've never seen such exquisite, knife mate i'm sure if i would if i came to your work <laughs> workshop paul but <laughs> this guy works in his father's workshop over there in america and that the the swords he produces and the knives are just beyond anything you can imagine everything down to the last detail yeah so i think he made one recently um Excelsior was that a sword? I, I Excalibur. I, yeah, I think it was a sort of along those lines. Excalibur. Yeah. I think he called this one Excelsior, but yeah, it was. Ah, oh, um, what's the name where they layer the 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 steel in such a way that you get that incredible pattern down the blade? Damascus or pattern welded? Yeah, and yeah. It, 
Yeah. And friends at home, this this might not sound a lot, but the, you have to set your your um when you fold the steel, you can layer it in a certain way. Um that when you bash it and then you fold it and then you extricate, is that the word when you make it go, when you bash it long, mm-hmm. um, that you, you, you get this incredible pattern down the blade, like it's interwoven. Um, and then the, all the rest of it was just made to exact perfection. Now, I mean, there's no, mm-hmm. there's no words for it. Um mm-hmm. Carl Royer, folks, if you just have a Google of this chap. And finally, he's he's laying gold, 24 karat gold, using a little chisel to chip out his name across the, the handguard. And, and then he's bashing gold into it. And he's even explaining this is a crap 24 karat gold. It's not, <laughs> you know, it's not working properly. And then when he when he um, machines it off or sands it off. It's just, you know, it's like the, 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 the Rolex equivalent of, <laughs> of a, <laughs> yes, absolutely fascinating. Yeah. The, the, there are a lot of top, top makers out there, you know, and uh, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of impressive skill uh, still in the knife and, and, and sword making world. You know, makers are, are relatively few and far between, you know, um, but yeah, there's a lot of top lads out there. Well, it's great that it's a skill that's come back and it's um, it's being reborn because obviously swords are <laughs> they're not they're not a big thing in not everyone. <laughs> I mean, there was a time, wasn't there, when probably most fighting men, age men, had some sort some sort of sword, or in Scotland, mm. the claymore. And sure, sure. I mean, you know, to to give you an idea of the demand. Um, and you know this qualifies that that you know that this is not a shameless plug for for my company. Please uh, do because, because I stopped. Uh, no, I I stopped taking orders a few years ago um, because my demand. I basically have about ten years worth of work lined up at the moment, um, and I think that's not unusual for high quality. You know, makers is your demand. You know, once you when, what, what, once your reputation starts to spread, word of mouth and so on, especially in military circles, and it spreads quick, uh, the, the, your demand, you know, is, is going up. And if you're only one pair of hands, that becomes harder to to keep mm-hmm. up with. Um, you know, I was I was telling folk that uh, well, five years was the lead time for FS knives, and ten years was about the lead time for custom work. And folk were still saying, "That's fine. I don't mind waiting." So I made the decision. Now, when does that end? I've got to cap that. So, yeah, so took that decision. And I think it's not unusual for high quality knife and sword makers that way to reach that point where the demand's going up and up. And you have to say, you know what, I'm going to cap things for the moment and play catch up uh, for a number of years. Yes, exactly. And and also, Paul, I look at these guys and say they're making some sort of, you know, bushcraft knife and they're putting, I don't know, like at least two days effort into it. If, if if not longer. And then when you look at the prices on the internet of these knives, they're pretty bloody low. I mean, you can get them Mm. from a tenner to, if you really were taking your bushcraft seriously, you could spend four or 500 quid. Oh, quite easy. Yeah. But after you take out the machine time and the materials and and all of that, there's very little profit in it for the, for the Mm. knife maker. Yeah, yeah. There's very few shortcuts, really, to making a good knife. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly by hand. You know, uh, if you're making everything by machine and it's all you know laser cut, and you're using big kit to do it, there's big investment involved in getting all that kit in the first place. So, um, but if it's small scale production, there's very few shortcuts. You know, to uh, essentially making that right shape of blade, um, getting that heat treatment right using the best quality steels you can and, you know, fit and finish of all the components, leather for the scabbard and, and doing all that work again by hand. There's very few shortcuts to it, you know, so it's all, it's heavy, it's heavy investment in the time that it takes to do it. And that's, that, you know, has to be reflected in the cost somehow. Yes. Um, talking of leather, that's my first effort there at a, a sheath or a scabbard. 
Oh yeah, good work. Um, this is the precursor to me making the one for the actual, for our actual bushcraft knife. Yeah. So I thought I'd make my son one for his Leatherman. Yeah. My son's brought up with knives. His first birthday present um, was a pen knife. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> um, and he's been, you know, using it since he was one. I'm, I'm, um, Excellent. <laughs> he, 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 he was driving a car by the time he was six. <laughs> like, I mean, on his own, not not with me on his lap. Um, I just want him to, you know, I want him to be hands on. And yeah, yeah it might yeah. sound reckless to people out there, but if you go to an indigenous community, something you know, the Inuits in the north, they need to give their kids a knife to play with. It's just completely normal. Sure, you know, obviously you teach them always, always cut away. But um, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. these the. the all these skills are being lost on and no dis I mean, no disrespect, but the, you know, the PlayStation generation. Mm. Um, I mean, we, my, I remember my grandma, I mean, I was about six when I got my first pen knife and she bought, she bought me one with a slightly kind of hook blade on it. And um, that was it. That was your weekend. You're out whittling stuff, yeah. you know, making yourself bow and arrows. Yeah, you Absolutely. Know, we used to rob um, uh, bamboo from a neighbor's garden and make ourselves blowpipes. And we we mm. thought we were James Bond, but that's my mm. first attempt. It, it's not meant to be good, uh, Paul. Hence the zigzaggy. <laughs> oh no, that's, that's all right. Um, what what it is? It works, it's I, good. <laughs> what it is? I wanted to mirror this one. So this is just your typical. I got this when I was in training in the Marines. That friends at home. That there is a, is the strap you get when you parachute, it come, it comes off and you find them on the ground, on the drop zone. It's some, some, some it, it's called a tie. And, um, in the military, you, if you can nab one, you use it for it to put on your knife, um, mm -hmm. Swiss army knife. Maybe we can talk a little bit about it because I just absolutely love this, this, this knife, this, this tool, mm -hmm. just that's so bloody they last so long and they're so precise. Um, yeah. But anyway, I digress. So I was trying to mold the lever like that. And as you're going to, as I'm sure you well know, it's not as easy as you think. I tried doing it in <laughs> hot water and I actually cooked, I boiled the lever <laughs> and it shrunk half the size and went rock hard. So yeah. in the end, I, I cheated and I did it in strips. So... Can, oh yeah yeah i just cut out u-shaped um strips that's why yeah. that's why the stitching's gone a bit wonky because <laughs> when i brought the i uh, did it on the the drill press and i brought the drill down and it was coming coming out the outs <laughs> yeah you're going <laughs> so to I was like, oh, fuck it i'll just put a lot it. of layers there yeah um <laughs> but i mean it's an art in itself isn't it it's yeah, yeah. Every different material, you know, um, is, is different skills. It's a different knacks, knacks when you're working with different materials. And if you're if you're a small scale maker, you're kind of obliged to do that. You know, you've got to work with different steels. You've got to work with brass, bronzes uh, and, uh, and woods and leathers as well. Uh, and they all have their their own issues when it comes to going wrong. So you learn, you know, what to avoid and how to avoid it along the way. Yeah, I mean the leather's funny because it's actually a dead animal, isn't it? A dead animal skin. It's got quirks in it and imperfections yeah, yeah. and and the different 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 animal hide types. You know, they act differently under the knife or or you know when you soak them and so on as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. What's when we talk about the swords? What's the most popular sword? What what swords most in demand to be recreated? Um, uh, that's a good question. One one actually. Uh, one of the swords I've made more of, perhaps, than anything else, is the He-Man Sword of Power. Yeah, <laughs> you know the He-Man cartoon series. Right from that, you know, I had a a mate. He says, "Oh, I've been a He-Man fan for years, mate. Can you make us one?" And I thought, oh, you know what? If something takes takes my fancy, you know, and I think it's interesting enough, I'll, I'll give it a go. And uh, yeah, I thought that's an interesting one. Yeah, give it a go. So. Uh, designed it up, but with the form of it, it's quite wide and it's quite thick. If you made it in iron or steel, it'd be ridiculously heavy, you know. So 
that it can cast aluminium for the whole thing. And aluminium you can po- polish up to practically a mirror finish. Uh, so that was the right material for the job. So yeah, me, I made quite a few of those. But in terms of the historic swords, um, you see, I don't tend to make batches of swords. You know, I'll make one or two swords at a time because uh, there's a lot more time invested in them. But I have made quite a few. I um, don't know if you can see it, the basket hilt swords behind me here, um, very much associated with the you know, Jacobite risings through 17th and 18th century. Um, and because I'm, I'm Scottish based and, you know, get involved in quite a lot of research in Scottish history side, then, yeah, I've made quite a number of, of these along the way. I bet the Claymore's popular as well. Yeah, yeah, I suppose over the years I've made made a few of those, the big two-handed uh, Scottish swords, mm. uh, fairly popular. Yeah. Not many pubs in Scotland haven't got a Claymore, Claymore on the wall. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I see everyone likes shiny things. Mm. <laughs> Can we talk about... Um, Sharpening, because somebody I learned an awful lot about sharpening blades was Ray Mears. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He he used to, not a lot, but he did a few, well, at least a couple of episodes on this sort of thing. So I um I invested in some Japanese water stones, mm-hmm. and they're incredible. And I got the little sort of clamp that sits on your table yeah. to stop <laughs> to stop them, like your dad's yeah. whetstone when you're a kid, and it would fly yeah, fly yeah. away. And yeah. you get a, a little tiny st- stone and you, you, you soak the wet stones in water overnight or whatever to, to mm-hmm. get, get them to work. And then you, you get sure. a slurry stone, don't you? And you make slurry. And that slurry is so fine that it mm-hmm. really gets the, not even the final bit on the blade. The final bit on the blade, after stropping it on leather, mm-hmm. Ray Mears runs it down the, uh, the edge of the window in his, in his vehicle. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I bought these stones. It's, 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 it's easier than it looks. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember I bought a Japanese chopping blade in the fish market in Tokyo mm-hmm. and the guy had a whetstone that was the size of my desk. It was incredible. And he just got my blade. So do you want it sharpened? And I said, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he just went <sighs> and you could see this guy just knew He'd, yeah. he'd probably done this hundreds of thousands of times. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yes, how, how do how do we deal with this? <laughs> um, yeah, sharpening is absolutely its own knack, you know, and it is something you, certainly if you're working with blades over time, you get a feel for, you know, the right angle and the right pressure and the right grit and material to be working with. And really that's all sharpening is about. You know, it's about it's about finding that right angle for your edge, um, about realizing how blunt your knife is in the first place. You know how much sharpening it needs, um, because sometimes you just need to just subtly hone an edge and just you know refine it. Um, if it's been well used, then you're going to have to take some steps back and start with you know a bigger grip, basically. Surface finishing, you know, putting a finish on any surface of, of steel and sharpening is it's a similar process in a way. You've got to move through the grits consistently and you've got to be thorough at every stage. You know, think, think about the surface of, of a blade because the edge, you know, acts the same. If at any stage um, you, you're leaving, you know, rough grit, and you go on to the next stage, well, that next stage isn't going to, you're, you're still going to have rough scratches, if you like, in the surface. So you've got to be as thorough as you can in the first stage, then the second stage, and then the third stage, and so on, to get everything reducing evenly. And dealing with the edge is exactly the same in a way as dealing with the surface of the steel. So it's simply about, yeah, knowing how much you have to sharpen, and getting the right uh, sharpening materials for that, you know. Um, with a relatively blunt blade, you're not going to do too well if you just take that straight to a, a fine diamond surface. You know, you're going to be there for weeks. So you've got to start with something rougher um, and just thoroughly work your way through. And it's getting a feel for the right angle. See, different, different knife types will be slightly different. You'll have more acute or more obtuse angles depending on what you're dealing with. Uh, some blades will go from the spine all the way 
down to that edge, what you call yeah, a zero uh, grind. So it'll just go straight to the edge. Uh, you can get an extremely sharp edge with that, but yeah, it takes a bit more work to carefully hone a, an edge back on it. Um, most will have what you call a bevel edge, so it'll go mostly to an edge, and then you'll get a secondary angle on that, and that's easier to maintain in a way. Um, yes, because you hear talk, don't you, of the Scandinavians have their Scandinavian grind. Yep. Which yep. is like the triangle. Triangle. Um, my one, I don't know what it is, Paul, because I think after I did a bit on the belt sander, which is an art in itself, and obviously when you've yeah. gone to the trouble of cutting out your blade and, and shaping it and everything, you don't, you just, one wrong grind it's going to screw the whole thing up mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, i mm -hmm. think i got the sort of rough bevel started but then i um i set up two electric drills with sanding pads there's big round sanding pads and i brought mm -hmm. them in close mm -hmm. and i synchronized the speeds <laughs> um so they were whizzing around at the same time right. and then i just i dragged the blade through it yeah 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 and I could feel it pulling the steel off. It's a real satisfying feel. And I could feel <laughs> it pulling the steel off. And finally, it's got to this, because they're rubber, the, pad, the pads are rubber, so they flex slightly. It's the, mm. it's the perfect contour on each side. So there's no, there's no, <laughs> no grind. Up. I don't know yeah. if I'm going to find out to my cost that it won't. It, I mean, even I haven't even sharpened it and it's, it's, probably sharper than mo mo most knives um, that I've ever used. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, fascinating. <laughs> Is that a grind? <laughs> Do you happen to know there's, there's, there's no, it, it's like literally it just, t it, it just tapers uh, to a point. Um, I was happy with it. It was just right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. I lose a convex. Com uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, be convex. That, 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 that sounds similar to, uh, I'll see if I can find it. Just grab one here. One of the best bushcraft knives I think's ever been designed and made. Uh, type D survival knife. Ah, yes. Yeah. Well, well this, this was originally Wilkinson. Wilkinson only made these, the Type D survival knife. And this has a, this is a, a convex grind to it, which means that as you impact... It splits, you know, it's great for, you know, bushcraft work um, because of that grind. And it also means there's actually quite a bit of meat still on the blade. You know, you're not intentionally reducing the weight of that blade as much as possible. You're maintaining as much weight as possible. And at the spine, these are about seven millimeters thick, actually quite hefty. It's almost like a hand axe, mm. but it's short and compact, you know. So that's kind of pretty much what you want in a bushcraft knife. Yeah, you want it to be compact. You want it to be meaty and weighty as well for doing that those kind of jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Unlike this one, I, I, I built this for show, really. Not show. I just wanted every feature that I'd ever thought about in a knife in this one. Sure. So for a proper bushcraft, obviously, you wouldn't have the saw, the serrated edge because... Um, you want to be able to hammer down on it with a log, don't you? To use it, yeah. To use it yeah, as a, a chisel. So yeah, that's a great dum. thing about a thick spine. Yeah, you can you can hammer on it. Yeah, mm. for sol solid splitting. That looks like what what they called in the navy a gollock. I don't know if you've heard that term. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I've heard. Yeah, yeah. But the, there was a development of this. Um, became known as the MOD survival knife for a while, but it was basically a much cheaper version. The fit and finish of the grips were not great. If you're using it in a tight grip for a while, um, you know, it blister up your hands in no time. And uh, the grind in the blade wasn't as smoothly convex as this. It came to pretty much a kind of chisel grind down here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was, a, you know, it was a kind of cheap version. Yeah, I was on the ship for a year and uh, I think there was 12 of us Marines on board and one day the buffer came up to our mess and he went, all right, fellas, got you these knives. <laughs> and he gave each and every one of us a, a knife just like that. Like I say, I think, I think we called it a gollock. Yeah. And um, 
He said, I've only got 12 of them and I ain't giving them to my Matlows. <laughs> 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 so, yes. Um, Paul, this has been an absolutely fascinating chat. What's, um, I, I can put your details below and all your social media below our, our YouTube video so people can at least follow you, even if they, they can't order stuff. But yeah, um, no problem. Yeah, so if you can just send me in a, you know, all your links, that 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 would be great. No problem, will do. What's the what's the future for you? Is there is there a, like a retirement plan in knife making? Does it <laughs> that laugh might tell you something? <laughs> Never had a retirement plan. I I really hope in a plan to just keep cracking on mm. because I love what I do. You know, I really do. Uh, and I feel lucky for it, you know. Yeah. I have very much chosen this path, you know, because I, I love it. And I feel that I could be quite happy doing it for the rest of my days. And I have known uh, knife and sword makers that have done exactly that. And they've kept working till the end. Mm. And I think that's a great thing to do. Yes. Um, old knife makers never die. They only... <laughs> blunt their blade just get sharper <laughs> just get that's 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 more polite and one last thing have you have have you got a youtube channel uh, i don't you know and and i probably should by now i, I have thought about, i have thought about it you know uh, i have done little videos now and again for the the facebook group and i quite enjoy doing it so mm. you know what you've you've just given me a wee spark to yeah, yeah well look I'll, I'll more than willing to help you with that it's I mean, I've done, I've actually done, I think, a couple of knife videos and I haven't tried to do them any polish or anything. I've just put up a few photos and said, right, that's when I'm doing this bit. A little bit yeah. of video of me on the grinder or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But it's one of those things, like if you don't start, it's never going to happen. Sure. And once you start, then you start to learn the little bits and bobs. Um, but I mean, they're so popular yeah. If I go back to our man here, you know, he, he, he's getting like millions. He's his episode twelve of of his El Excelsius sword. So he did it in twelve, twelve. It's got a million views. Wow! Right, and it's a half hour video. So to give you an idea, he's he's probably made a couple of grand on that video. Right. All right. And all it really means is having a GoPro set up, you know, looking mm. one down at your work, one looking at you. Mm -hmm. A lot of it, he just narrates over, you know, he'll film it and he just narrates over it afterwards. And, um, yeah. and it, it's satisfying having a YouTube channel, but also I think it's great for our young people to see these skills and to realize that, you know, if you spend six hours on Xbox, you, you literally, you, okay, you might have had a bit of, you pass the day, but there's nothing, you get nothing at the end of it except mm -hmm. a, a score. Yeah. But six yeah. hours in a workshop, you can come out of it with something that's, you know, improved your mm -hmm. skill. Yep. Made yep. you happy. Mm -hmm. Demonstrate. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah demonstrate. Like you say, you know. Demonstrate to the opposite sex that you know how to bloody defend yourself. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. like you might. You might get a few chicks there, boys. <laughs> like you say, with, with with your lads, you know, teaching them hands-on, mm. that's invaluable learning, you know, in life. And, and it, I think it can give you a taste for that as well, you know, and it can it can help sort of direct your own interests in life as you go as well. Yeah. Do you, I should just to be fair, do, do you come across many female um, craftsmen? Yeah. Uh, you know, pl plenty of jewellery makers and such, but the uh, actual bladesmiths and, and makers, not many, not many. Mm -hmm. There's only one I know in Scotland, um, and there's there's an exceptional scissors maker uh, in England, Grace Horn. She's absolutely incredible, you know, next level craftsmanship. Um, but, you know, there's not too many out there. So that means there's only room for more. Yes. Do you remember, well, it probably wasn't so much the old days, but people go around in vans and, and they pull up in your street and you take all your scissors and knives out and they, 
Have you come across this? Was that uh, yeah? You, you, what, you get sharpening. Yeah, you get the sharpening person comes around like once uh, a yeah. month, and and you take all your. I mean, I've seen it. I can't even remember where I've seen it. Right, it's not. Right. It's not something that happens in my street. But yeah, I remember seeing in Edinburgh. There used to be used to be somebody went around Edinburgh right, right enough. Mm. But uh, I don't know if I don't know if they still do. It's something I offer just as a local service, you know, um, is sharpening. And, and I get folk bringing along, you know, gardening tools and, and axes and all sorts, you know. So you don't know <laughs> what type of edge you're going to have to deal with from one day to the next. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, we didn't even talk about that. Our next project is a, an axe for my boy. He wants, uh, he loves all his like Viking stuff. And yeah. And um, how are half the kids' cartoons these days of people? hacking each other with <laughs> it's, it's yes um so we're gonna we're gonna move on to a, a, a double bladed axe um nice. so yes paul it's been incredible mate um like i say i'll put your your links below the video it's this has been a dream come true of mine to chat to somebody <laughs> of your of your stature um in the knife making profession so thank you ever so much it's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. Thanks very much for having us. Brilliant, brilliant. So, uh, and Paul, just stay on the stay on the line while I say goodbye to everybody. Uh, friends at home, you can follow Paul McDonald Armories on social media. I suggest you do. It's nice to have something pop up in your feed that's not a photo of someone's <laughs> someone's lunch. Um, so, uh, yes, I'd encourage you to do that. And massive thank you all for tuning in for another episode of Bought the T-Shirt Podcast.